Join us now is the man himself, David Sirota. Great to see you, sir. Good to see you both. Yeah, our pleasure. Um, we we're just singing your praises, and I think uh, very much deservedly so, because Lever News has done the best and some of the only reporting on how exactly we ended up with this train derailment in Ohio, with it being as devastating as it ultimately is, and an attempt by uh, the Biden administration and Pete Buttigieg at the uh, Department of Transportation to pretend like, oh, there's nothing we could do about it, like we're just powerless here. So I'd first love for you to walk people through the chain of corrupt events, starting with the Obama administration, that contributed to the derailment and, like I said, the devastation from the derailment. So the story that has been told, or at least finally is starting to be told, is the story of the uh, the fallout from the disaster. Uh, I think the story that is rarely told in situations like this is how did we get to this point? What what policy changes happened to make this uh, the conditions exist for a disaster like this to happen? And that's what this what the story that we've been reporting from the beginning has been. So you have to rewind the tape about 10, 15 years. And uh, 10 or 15 years ago, there was a series of um, train derailments uh, and, and specifically hazmat train derailments, oil trains and the like, uh, and one train derailment in New Jersey involving the same chemical uh, that is at issue in Ohio. Uh, and in the aftermath of that, the Obama administration, uh, under some pressure, uh, did the right thing in the sense of putting forward uh, a proposal, a rule proposal at the Department of Transportation to start better regulating uh, trains that carry hazardous materials. Uh, and so this is about 2013, 2014, uh, and the like. Uh, and the the proposed rule was everything from uh, disclosure requirements to state and local governments so that they could know and their first responders could know what kinds of hazardous materials are moving through their areas. Disclosure, uh, tank fortification rules, how strong the tanks are that are carrying the hazardous materials, uh, speed rules rules, uh, and of course, uh, electronic braking rules. The idea was that trains that were classified as uh, high hazard flammable trains, HHFTs, would be subjected to all these rules, including a mandate to put uh, in place better brakes to to slow trains in a in a more effective way to prevent derailment. So that's about 2013, 2014. The National Transportation Safety Board comes to the Obama regulators and says, hey, listen, these rules should apply broadly to trains carrying all sorts of hazardous materials, in particular, known as class two hazardous flammable materials, uh, not just class three. These are technical terms. You know, class, you know, there was a debate. Should it, should these rules only apply to trains carrying uh, uh, oil and ethanol? And, and the NTSB said, no, it should be broad. Uh, the chemical industry then came to the Obama administration saying, no, we, we want, <laughs> we want the rules to be narrow. We, we don't want to have to deal with all of these upgrades uh, for our stuff, our, our non crude oil, non ethanol, but nonetheless dangerous chemicals. And the Obama administration at that point sided with the chemical industry lobbyists, narrowing these rules so that they only largely apply to uh, very, very large oil, uh, oil trains, uh, trains of 20 or more cars of, of oil. So a narrowing there, giving the uh, chemical companies, giving sort of industry uh, a break. But the rule that passed did include a mandate for the trains that it covered to at least include those electronic brakes. Right now, the trains in America carrying freight are largely using Civil War era uh, air brakes. Uh, the rail industry itself has said uh, repeatedly that ECP brakes, as they're known, uh, are much better for safety and can can reduce accidents, uh, mitigate uh, derailments when they happen and the like. That's the rail industry itself. And the idea was, okay, so the rule was narrowed. That's not great. But at least the mandate will start compelling, forcing the industry to start uh, using this equipment in a much bigger way with the hope of, with the goal of making it industry standard. So that, that's at the end of the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. Then the American uh, Association of Railroads, which is the lobbying group for the railroads, sees that Donald Trump has won. Uh, they start pushing uh, Senate Republicans to champion the idea of repealing 
the break mandate, even though the mandate, again, is only uh, now put on a limited number of trains, they want they don't want any of it, mm. which is, by the way, a, a side note, kind of kind of insane in that only a few years before that, the rail industry was saying ECP breaks are great. The moment the government was thinking about mandating it, that's when their lobbying, uh, their lobbying apparatus went into action. Uh, and they ultimately convinced Donald Trump uh, to use his executive authority to repeal the break rule. So now the industry is under no mandates at all to use better breaks writ large. Fast forward now to uh, what happened in Ohio. Uh, we don't exactly know what caused uh, the, the accident, but we can say this for sure. The train was not classified as a high hazard flammable train, which is mind blowing uh, when you see the pictures of fireballs and mushroom clouds and 100 foot of flames. So state and local authorities were not given, uh, a, a, and this is confirmed by the governor of Ohio, uh, because of this classification, they were not given uh, advanced warning of what kind of chemicals were on this train. Uh, the, the tank rules were not in, in place. Uh, the ECP brake rules were uh, not in place. Again, both for two reasons. One, the rule didn't cover it, the train generally. And two, Donald Trump had repealed that rule. So those are the decisions that have created, helped create the, the kind of safety situation on the nation's rails in the lead up to this disaster. And these were decisions made by elected officials. And of course, the, the last thing to say on, on this story is that the Biden administration has made no attempt publicly uh, in terms of rulemaking, what we can see from the documents, no attempt to reinstate the break rule, no attempt to use executive authority to broaden the definition of what a high hazard flammable train is, uh, even though obviously under the under the law uh, and experts we've talked to, former regulators say that the Department of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg's department, has the authority to begin a new rulemaking process. That hasn't happened. What we do know has happened is that on the uh, Buttigieg Transportation Department's docket right now, is a proposal to consider weakening brake testing rules, the, oh the frequency with which train brakes need to be tested. Wow. And, and just one thing, uh, point of clarification, David, as you said, we don't know specifically what caused this crash, but I believe it was you all that um, quoted some experts as saying that it could, having these more advanced braking systems in place could have mitigated the damage. And they described it, the train is like a slinky where the, the energy from the back, you know, pushes the whole thing together. And then you have more cars ultimately derail when you don't have these more advanced braking systems that could prevent that sort of like slinky crushed up effect to use some very technical yes, terms a here. Of, yes. A, f a former federal uh, uh, safety official said to us that would ECP brakes have made a difference in this uh, situation? And he said, uh, yes, it was unequivocal. Uh, I, I think we don't, I mean, would it have derailed completely? I'm not sure we know. Would it have made the derailment uh, 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 less bad? Uh, it, it's hard to say in which ways, but that's what, what they're saying. And look, that's what the industry has said in the past, right? I mean, that's what Norfolk Southern, uh, Norfolk Southern touted ECP brakes before it started lobbying against uh, the mandate for ECP breaks. Now there are there are other parts of this too. I mean, I mean the Wall Street Journal reported that there was uh, a potential fire on the rail uh, miles beforehand, uh, mm -hmm. but there are That's no on federal video, by requirements. The way. That's on video. They yeah, have that on there video. There are no yeah. there are no requirements for give workers on the train warning about that. Of course, there's the understaffing of the railways generally, where, where the companies have been cutting staff uh, to jack up their profits. Workers have been warning this is going to reduce our ability to maintain the rails, uh, reduce our ability to, to keep uh, the rails safe. So all of that is at play. It's really, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a horrible, perfect storm. Uh, and I think it's really important to look at the the decisions that were made that create the conditions uh, for things like this. We, we need to know that information to know who hasn't made decisions and what kinds of decisions can be made now moving forward to prevent this from happening in the future. So are there other chemicals that are just as dangerous as these chemicals, if not more dangerous, that are also kind of wrongly put in this category of like, actually, this isn't all that toxic? Do you Do you know? Look, we know, uh, uh, for, for one thing, vinyl chloride 
vinyl chloride uh, is a class two chemical. Uh, that's the, the class of chemical that the NTSB, we back in 2015, 2014, said to the Obama administration, this needs to be covered. And by the way, it wasn't just uh, the NTSB. There were uh, uh, regulators acknowledged that there were local communities that had written to the uh, regulators saying, we want all hazardous materials on all trains uh, to be covered by this rule. And they just said, it's not gonna be part of the scope of this rule. So I think, you know, I, I mean, and one thing that's kind of disturbing in reading some of these documents, you know, you see the regulators parsing words, trying to make a distinction between like a, ha a, a what do they call it? a flammable chemical and a combustible chemical, right? Like there were, combustible liquids on this Ohio train, but they weren't classified as flammable liquids, right? This is the kind of nonsense that goes on in, in lobbying uh, and in, in, in rulemaking uh, where these words become so parsed uh, that it's, it's impossible to know what's really going on. Well, and as you pointed out, we all saw the massive plumes of smoke and fireball. And the reason that they did this quote unquote controlled release was because they thought that these uh, that these chemicals could literally explode like a bomb, and we're supposed to think, oh, this is not it's not hazardous, not flammable. Don't don't need the extra safety regs to, here. To your knowledge, has anybody in the media made the distinction about this chemical? Had to, you know, have they said, hey, this is actually this should be put in this category, and it's not, or has like the mainstream media just been totally out to lunch on this? <laughs> No, I think, look, I think the, the classifications, I think, uh, you know, I'm not a, I, I'm not obviously a chemist, but I think the, the classifications matter for uh, the different pressures, the different environments, the different uh, ways they need to be handled uh, in, in various technical settings. But I, I, I think the at issue here is if you're going to say that a train is a high hazard flammable train, should it? only be oil trains or should we be honest and say listen uh, other things other than oil can blow up uh, and we need to take that take that seriously i i don't think in in the cup look in the coverage of, of what's gone on there's been very little coverage of the decisions that led to this situation uh, there's been very little coverage of um the specific rulemaking that happened and, and i want to be clear I think people, there has been some coverage focused in on Trump repealing the ECP break rule. And I think that obviously deserves a, a lot of scrutiny. That is, that, it, that to me, that's an illustration of how cavalier the government writ large has been when it comes to the government, uh, to, when it comes to the rail industry. They just, it's just like, we're, we're, we're going to repeal, an, uh, uh, the, the ECP break rule is already limited. We're going to repeal it because the industry asks us to. You know, the industry says jump, we say how high. Uh, but I think you got to go back further as well and understand this is a this is a set of decisions that span two administrations really three administrations right obama uh, regulators uh, look kudos to them for at least saying we have to do do some kind of rule but then uh, keeping the rule limited uh, in a way that appeased the chemical industry donald trump immediately doing exactly what the rail industry wanted uh, and then the biden administration uh, pete Buttigieg, uh, not really doing anything at all when it comes to this stuff. If you want to see me and Crystal Ball interview legends like Noam Chomsky, Cornell West, and more, subscribe to Crystal Kyle and Friends on Substack. $5 a month gets you the video version a day early. Remember, we take zero ad dollars for this podcast. Or you can sign up on Substack for free and get the audio version a day later. Link in the video description box below.